This morning, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. I just want to read my scripture verse, and then we're going to jump straight into those things. Are you guys ready there at the back? Micah 6 verse 8, and it says the following, He has told you, O man, what is good. And then it explains that. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? I'm going to pray once more, and then we're going to start preaching. Father, your word is always powerful, Father. So we just declare as a community our hearts are prepared for you to speak, Father. Father, I, I am limited standing up here, but I am in need of your anointing to rest upon me, Father. So I just humbly bow down and, and ask for you to touch my lips this morning, Father, so that when I speak, it will be words that can transform people's lives, but not because of my power or my ability, Father, but because of your anointing that rests upon me. Father, I just declare that I am limited and I am broken and I am not enough unless you touch me this morning, Father. So I bow down before your throne. And ask that you would give me the ability to be an effective steward of your people this morning. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name and everyone says, Amen and Amen. So I'm nervous to preach to you guys this morning. Now you know, if I'm nervous, you're going to get nervous. And we're all going to get nervous and they lock the doors already. So it's just one of those things, okay? So I, 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 wanna, I want to warn you beforehand. If you're going to draw my message out of context, context, you will probably make me a bad guy this morning. Can you feel the awkwardness in this day? I love it. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I want you to open your heart, and I just want to share this with you. My intentions is completely good this morning. I want to share something that's on my heart, and I hope that the information that I'm going to share with you today will be helpful to your life. Okay, no, we're not talking about mother-in-laws, we're not talking about marriage, but we are talking about the sec- second most, first most, we're going to talk about money. Okay, 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 yeah. you, got, you see, I told you and you still don't feel any better. Okay, so, <laughs> so I want to I address a couple of things to you this morning and I hope that it will be a blessing to you all the same way. It has been in my heart. Now, we are busy with a series called The Scribes Before the Scrolls, and the idea simply is this. I want to tell, talk to you about all the people that inspired the writing of the Bible. Now, this is a disclaimer I give every single time. Obviously, God was involved in the process, but there were men and women that stood up. They lived their lives, and they wrote a couple of things, or, or other people wrote about them, and this is where we draw our inspiration from, and God used them, and that's what we look at. Now, the guy we're looking at today is Micah. He's a minor prophet. He's a minor prophet, and he addresses a couple of very interesting things when you read the book. The nice thing is it's nice and short, okay, so you can quickly glance through that. But the whole idea is simply this, that there was economical issues in the house, okay. So the problem with that is I want us to to peek into this snippet of history, look at what Micah was complaining about, and draw from that what we can draw. So the idea about Micah's book is simply this, that leaders and prophets became wealthy through theft and greed. Okay, I'm going to say this one more time. The leaders and the prophets, okay? So you can't just blame government on the one side in this context, okay? You, you need to blame the god fearing people at the same time. And for some reason, Micah is concerned because of this idea that there's theft and greed. And from this perspective, he now addresses to the community certain things that we need to fix. But here's the thing, you know, you might be wondering, but why am I sharing this with you, you know? We don't steal. Well, I mean, those extra copies at work doesn't count, and those extra phone calls, I mean, that doesn't count, you know. The, the pens, highlighters, in our school, it's red pens, Latsakiana, and green pens. And, you know, we, there's a reason why we, we lock toilet paper away at church, okay? You can't even go to the bathroom in our church without paper being locked away, okay? So, obviously, I'm not talking to the right crowd, okay? Okay, it's not you guys, but, but I understand that theft, it's, it's, it's seldom people say, oh, I'm stealing, okay? And, and greed is the other thing. Greed is always someone else, right? It's never us. It's never, never us, okay? If you want to know if you are greedy, if you got one pack of tumbles at home and you have three kids and you had to count the amount that you shared, you know, 
you will realize that, you know, uh, okay, I'm not going to say you are greedy. Uh, I'm obviously, this, this, is got, this is just hypothetical examples that I'm using. It's not grounded in reality. But, you know, then, you know, you know, sometimes we take a little bit more than we give. And the, the hassle with this regard is that, that Mike has got this on his heart, that it, it became so severe that it began to affect morality in a community. You see, I, I mean, it's, it's easy to joke about small stuff. You know, who's taking the last potato? Who gets the last rollo in the pack? I mean, we argue about those things on a consistent basis. But the problem is when things escalate so much, where it, it, it becomes a moral issue. And so what Micah is addressing in this idea is that our management of our finances becomes a moral implication in our lives. So you can't distance... Your finances separately from your walk with God. Now, now let, me just, let me just get this straight off the bat, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking a guilt trip for you to give more money to the church, okay? This is not a tithing conversation. I just want to get that from the get-go, okay? This is a personal finances, finance conversation concerning greed and theft. Okay, well, we don't steal. Let's just call it. Okay, we don't greed. We... I'm just preaching to no one and we're just listening to that, okay? Let's, let's, let's just call that. So, so here's the thing, you know. You, you, you might be sitting here and like, this is still not relevant for me because I'm going to talk about rich people, right? But here's the nice thing about this, you know. That, that's great because all of I'm not wealthy, so you can preach whatever you want to. Everything I'm going to say, it's not relevant because I'm not stealing, I'm not greedy, and here's the thing, I'm, I'm, I'm also not wealthy. So I would love to address those to that topic um, with you today. As greed is always someone else, wealth is always someone else. Well, when you look up the ladder, what I'm trying to say with this is when you look at the people above you, you will never be able to see yourself as wealthy. Because you will always be comparing yourself to someone whose, in, whose income or materialistic things or whatever is always above yourself. And so we come into this idea or this mindset that we can never be wealthy because look at that. But I want you to understand something. When you begin to look down, you are on top of the ladder for some people. You are complaining about blessings that other people are still praying about. You are, you are complaining with, with blessings and materialistic things in your hand. The reason is because there's always a next step. There's always a greater. There's always someone on top. But the problem is that we need to realize that when we just shift our attention, that there will always be someone that is in more greater need than us. You know. So when you look down you will realize that you are the wealthy one. And here's the other problem with this concept of wealth. Wealth is, is relative. So it, it shifts. There's not one definition of wealth. Okay, let me explain it to you this way, okay? When you go to uh, uh, an established, established first world country, for example, um, and you walk into there, you, you will feel very poor because you will look at people and say they are wealthy. Until you walk into a community in a third world country and you had the privilege of riding in a vehicle to get there and you see that some of them, they don't even they have water and then you realize, man, in this context, I am the wealthy one. So that's the problem with wealth. How do we measure this? How do we gauge ourselves? Am I greedy? And so stealing is a topic for another day. But how do we gauge ourselves? Because the challenge with this concept is that wealth is relative and i'm gonna show you how fantastically greedy no one is in this room because i'm not talking to anyone specifically okay because the reason why i'm talking about money is because according to micah financial management can have a moral implication in our lives but we tend to water this down why because i get this okay let me just put a disclaimer out here you know i know many people are negative due to multiple levels of corruption 
you know. So you don't talk about money. Churches can't talk about these things because churches want to get rich and want to build bigger buildings and all those fantastic things. And, you know, in some certain senses, you are correct. But I'm not talking about a building today. I'm talking about the church's responsibility to our resources which we receive. And that includes your salaries and your assets and all those things. And by the way, that includes me as well. You might get slightly offended with what I'm going to say now, okay? Slightly, okay? But before we get rude, we gave you free coffee, okay? Because we make bad financial decisions, we tend to become self-righteous. It's going to get a little bit worse, okay? I just wanted to test the field. Nobody's walking out, so I can take this, this one step further. You see, we are encouraged to determine our generosity based on our income and not our expenses. Okay, okay. okay so you know, if you get that, oh, it's going to get a little bit worse. Now I'm going to spend some time on this point that I want to explain to you. So listen, listen to this. Okay. We can't be associated with greed because none of us is we're not wealthy. Okay. Yeah, you struggle to be wealthy. Because of the bad financial decisions that you've been making. Now, let me just be clear, okay? There's something real like poverty. I'm not, I'm not bashing anyone. I'm not throwing stones. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm talking about what you receive. So the idea is there's a reason why the Bible encourages us to determine your generosity based on your income. Because let me tell you this, okay? What if I told you there are people in this world that pay 40,000 rand a month and they don't feel wealthy? Some of you were like, really are they crazy no they're not crazy well when you pay 40,000 rand a month and you have 20 million rand of debt you are not going to feel wealthy because you have all these expenses so here's the thing we like to determine our generosity based on what is left so all I need to do in my life I need to make enough debt and I need to feel sorry for myself and determine I'm not greedy I'm just not wealthy. But the problem is that, you know, the Bible teaches us that we need to look at the blessings we receive, and that is the measurement we determine on our generosity. But what do we do as people? The more we get, the higher we increase our lifestyle. The more we receive, the greater amount of debt that we make. And this is a nonstop battle over and over and over again. And guess what we do? We call ourselves, I'm not greedy, I can't make a living, but you're paying 30,000 rand a month. It's not an income problem. It's a financial management problem. It's a discipline problem, ladies and gentlemen. And, and don't get me wrong, if, if you feel this is not relevant for you, I mean, I'm not, I'm not picking on anyone here, you know. Some people, your income is so low, there's nothing you can do. So I'm, I'm not bashing that. I'm talking about people where we mismanage our finances and we have a pity party for ourselves and say, I can't be generous, I can't do anything, this is all I can afford to give. Well, it's not because God has not been good to you, it's probably the other way around. Uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's a little bit tough, okay? Well, you, this is the idea of Micah. He says, you know, we, we, we're living in difficult times in the book of Micah. And he says, all these leaders and spiritual guys, they, they're taking land and taking things and getting wealth for themselves. And they become greedy. And now Micah says, because of your greed, this is going to have a moral implication before God because you are not doing the right thing. So now the question for us is, and this personal determination is, are we doing the right thing? Or are we becoming self-righteous because we have made so many bad financial decisions in our lives and we pay above a bracket of the general population? I'm just taking an example. I'm just taking an example quickly. The hassle is not the income. The hassle is what you decide to do with the blessings that you have received. And if you are anything like me with tumbles, okay, we miss these small little things in our lives. And without you even being aware, without, let me swap that around. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. Without me being self-aware of my financial position, I am greedy even when I don't feel wealthy. I am selfish 
even though I've only got a 200 land left in my bank account, for example. But the problem is not always that. It's we're living in a, uh, in, in, in a perspective where we just make so many bad financial decisions and God is good to us and God is blessing us and is, is giving so many opportunities for us and we are growing our wealth. We are doing all these fantastic things. But you need to be careful and I need to be careful that we have that fine balance between receiving things and then also at the same time being a blessing to those around us. If, if you want a phenomenal spiritual leader when it comes to finances, there's no better guy than Dave Ramsey. Oh, that is my personal opinion. Um, and one of the ideas, he goes through these seven baby steps, which is phenomenal. I mean, we've been following that since a very young, younger age, since a very younger age. And so um, at the bottom line, he says, now, what do you do when you get to the end of this? You know, what do you do when your finances is stable? What do you do when, when things are settled and you are comfortable? And he says the following, the whole purpose is you get to do the best thing ever. You get to be generous in people's lives. So what I love about his agenda is that we are building, we are growing, and uh, don't get me wrong over here, we are, pre we are taking care of our families, we are being generous. There's, there's no hassle with these elements, but the, the purpose of blessing is to be a blessing. The purpose of being stable is to provide that for some other people. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying take your money and you throw it off a roof and you're being Christ-like. No, you're not. You're being a bad steward of what God has given to you. I'm not talking about being ridiculous. I'm talking about being a good steward of what has been entrusted to you. Now, how do you figure out if you're a good steward? You use a calculator. It's, it's not complicated. But the problem is, we seldomly use a calculator even in our month-to-month -month budget for ourselves, you know. We, twin, we tend to swipe so much, the plastic smells already when you swipe it, you know. It smells like someone's bad clutch, you know. And, and, and we do all this, and we, without, without even realizing, I've spent so much money on myself, I get to the end of the month, and I can't afford to be a blessing. I can't afford to invest into someone's life. I can't afford to give someone who's hungry something a little bit extra. Why? Because without you using your calculator, you have spent so much on yourself. You have spent so much just taking things. And now at the end of the month, I say, well, I'm not wealthy because I've got no money. But what have you been spending your resources on? Now, let me just give another disclaimer. Don't let any other grown man or woman tell you what to do with your money, okay? This is not a conversation of this is what you need to do. I'm talking, I'm having a conversation about self-reflection, okay? I'm having a conversation about giving you principles that you take, and you take those principles and look at your budget with those principles, and then you determine, you know, am I considered as someone that's generous? Am I considered as someone that's a good steward of the blessings that God has given. Or do we misuse our blessings? Do we misuse the wonderful things that God has given? Come on, man. I know some people that the poorer they were, the more generous they were. Now that they've got a lot of things, they are so stingy, they are only take care of themselves. And I'm just wondering what, what happened when you came to God. You, you were willing to give everything, man. You were picking people up. You were driving around. And, and again, please understand the context. This is not a, a bashful message. This is a message about we get comfortable. We get, we get entitled to the blessings that God blesses us with. And if we are not careful, we kind of fall into the bracket that, you know, Maybe I've been a little bit greedy. Maybe, maybe, maybe my challenge was not always my income. Maybe my challenge was the way I spent those things that I received. Maybe I'm not as self-disciplined as I'm supposed to be. Maybe, I'm, may, maybe for some of you, and, and this is how bad it is, okay? I'm talking about generosity. But sometimes the addiction of greed is so severe we can't even break it for our own benefit. Sometimes we can't even save for ourselves. And again, this is not, you guys are, why well, it feels like I'm preaching to someone this morning, okay? Just, just do that nervous <laughs> laugh or something, man. Just do something. Just, just do something. 
But I, I want to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, that God has put potential inside of you. He's put a mind inside of you. He's put ability inside of you. And you can use those blessings. You can use your gifting. You can use your resources. You can use the lessons you have learned. And you can build something that can change the lives of not only your family's life, not only your children's life, but it can change other people's lives around you just as much. But because we are so blessed, we tend to lack discipline. If, and and, and w- one of the interesting lessons as, as we go with Dave Ramsey and as he's got some conversations and stuff, what I always realize when he talks about wealthy people, the, the context of his conversation, the wealthy people he talks about, they are not reckless with their finances. They are disciplined with Hey, heaven, hell, or a uh, free uh, geld in the bank. If you don't understand, I just said klomp, uh, uh, many, many. Even with substantial finances in their bank account, they still run their business on a strict budget. They still measure their expenses. They still measure their income. They still invest into training. They still do the right things at the right time. You will never come to a point where you just spend your money. Just like, that's the quickest way to lose it. So the wealthy people don't do, okay? They are careful. You know, I, and, and then there's another thing as well, and, the, and this is just me just, just, just talking from my heart here this morning. They, then you get these wealthy people, they never borrow to you either. They refuse to borrow to you. And then we walk away and say, look how greedy they are. No, no, no. They've learned the lesson or two over the years. They have picked up on certain things over the years. There's certain skill sets that they picked up. And they realize that it's it's not a concept of greed. It's about being a good steward and building in habits. I heard a story recently of a gentleman. He he um, He got signed as a pro athlete. And in one day, he got something like, I'm going to use it in rands, okay? So please don't quote me on the exact number. I'm not using exact names, but it's a real story I heard. He got six million rand in one day. One day. Oops. One day. Okay. He, he came from a poor background. He just got signed a contract. He's a fantastic athlete. One day. Because of the signature, six million rand. Oops, there we go. The next day, he was one million rand in debt. Let me explain something to you. You can get as much as you want, but if the way it goes out is not managed and disciplined to us, it's going to be, that guy is wealthy. Do you think he feels wealthy? He doesn't feel wealthy. He doesn't have money to take his, buy food for his kids. Why? Because he bought three cars in one day. Three cars. Why? Because he got some money. He didn't have the skill set to manage that money. And actually what we talk about, if you are well-versed in this type of conversation, is that he was being greedy. He was being reckless. He was being selfish. He got a fantastic opportunity to put things in place that he could never do in his family. And he wasted it all. It was wasted. I want to ask you a question. Are you wasting the blessings that God has blessed you with. Do you calculate? Do you do a budget? Do you sit with a calculator? Do you control where things are flowing to? Are you in con- let me let me listen to what I'm asking you. Are you being a good steward? That is what only you can determine. No one else can determine that. So, why am I talking about money? Because I'm concerned that without us being awake on this topic, we have fallen into a moral issue. And I'm concerned that it flows over in many areas in our lives. Because we can't control it, it overflows in many areas, and now we struggle to take care of our kids, we try and struggle to provide for our families, we are struggling in all these areas, and it's simply because we are not disciplined with the blessings. Anyone knows, you know, I always wanted a car when I was younger. Always wanted a car. 
And then you get the car and then you realize there is accountability towards the vehicle that you've received. There is a burden attached to the blessing. There's a responsibility attached to the blessing. You can't do whatever you want because then I'm not, I will have a car, but it won't be drivable because I don't have enough finances to pay for the gas. In South Africa, petrol. Okay. <laughs> So, so the, the hassle is this, okay, the, the issues that I'm, I hope you guys are, are, are hearing my heart on this. I want to encourage you, you know, don't, don't have this mindset of, we're going to heaven, these things doesn't matter. Man, my goodness, it matters how you manage. Well, that, well that's a good tweet. Uh, no royalties, I won't charge you nothing, okay. It, what did I say? It, ma it matters what you manage. That was good, that was good, write it down. Okay, short snippet, YouTube snap. Okay, fantastic. It, it matters how you manage. And you get promoted on your capabilities of being able to manage resources. Whether that is human resources or materialistic resources. And it's exactly the same in the church. I want, to, I want to speak freedom of your life today. I want to encourage you to go learn about your finances. I want to encourage you to go use a calculator. I want to encourage you to go print a bank statement and look at what you are doing with your finances. It's not a sin, it's a taboo. It's not something that we hide away. I want to say the opposite. I want to tell you that if you are mismanaging what you have been given, that is going to be a bigger moral implication in our lives than you actually looking at what you are doing with your resources. Well, I hope you guys were going to say amen on that one. But okay, never mind. You are, I mean, don't worry about it. I understand it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one. Okay. But now there's another hassle that I want to address, okay? just want to bring balance into this. There exists a tension between the inside and the outside. So I just want to get this out, okay? Some of us, we are sorted on the inside, okay? In our opinion, okay? There's, there's peace before God and all those type of things. But then our outside doesn't always show that, okay? So I know a lot of people that's good inside the church but i struggle to see the good outside the church so then you get the opposite side as well okay so again i'm not just talking about being generous i also want to give you another warning be careful that you become so generous on the outside that you are compensating for a lack of healthiness on the inside you see, there's two types of people in church. I've known people that know the Bible and everything is good and fantastic, but they're outside, so they, they struggle to show it on the outside. Then I've met people that are overly generous to churches. They give as much as they can. They give quite a lot, but you never see them connected, involved, and you don't see their health on the inside. You see, they're overcompensating for materialistic things, but you need to understand something. I want you to think, when we talk about God, I want you to think about this idea of balance. It's not about how much money you give and it's not always about how generous you are on the outside. You need to have a healthy relationship with God on the inside. And then you need to have fruit that reflects that health of the inside. So it's going to be a little bit of both. It's not good enough just to say, I just come to church and I just go home. We have a responsibility towards our family, families, towards our community, towards society. And then at the other side, it's also not good enough just to pay your way to heaven. That's not going to work. Well, in some churches, it does work, okay? But in this one, you know, the way we read our Bible, it just, it just doesn't work, you know? I'll maybe give you a nicer seat and you, we'll give you some fancy coffee or something like that. But, you know, I can't, I can't tell you you're going to go to heaven because you gave the church money. No, it's, it's not a, it's, <laughs> it's a moral topic that I'm talking to you about. So be careful of being so self-righteous on the inside that you are useless on the outside. And then be careful that you are so useful on the outside that you become self-righteous and don't think I don't need the inside. It's, it's, it's a full package that we need to accept and take in. Why do I have a feeling you guys are angry at me this morning? Micah 6 verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? basically referring to very popular sacrifices the next verse will the lord be pleased with thousands of rams with ten thousand of rivers of oil shall i give my firstborn for my transgressions very important terminology linking this back to um, the idea of atonement for, for for sin the fruit of my body for sin of my soul in other words can, can i do something on the outside to fix something on the inside 
And so then the next verse, and this is what we started off with, according to Micah. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And he's going to give us, I think it's three points. And it's, it's going to sound like I'm going to repeat previous sermons, okay? So he's going to give us three points. So what is good? The next verse, or the next part, it says, And what does the Lord require for you but to do justice? Do what it takes to make things right. Remember previously we spoke about it's not, it's not revenge, okay? It's about doing what you can here, now, in your surroundings, in your family, you know? Maybe you, so let me put it this way, maybe you've been a little bit reckless with your finances, okay? Here's the good news. Just do some justice. And I, I want to ask you this. What can you do to make it right? Buy a calculator, okay? Print. Th th those those papers you print that, that work, okay? That's just, well, this is not stealing. Go print your bank statements there and then you take it home and then you, it means do justice. Do, do justice. Maybe this is a topic that's new to you. So all I'm asking you, what does God require from us to do? Do what is needed to make it right. You know? It's, it's simple. And here's the thing. I'm not even going to tell you how to do this. I'm just going to tell you that if this bothers you, fix it. Next part. It says, you need to love kindness. I know we like it, and we enjoy receiving this, but the idea is, if, if you want to do good, remember this is the context of Micah, this is the context of greed and theft and all these are there. What, what is the solution? How can we be good? We can, we can apply justice, and we can, to, we can love kindness. You can be kind to people. And that's an area we all can work on. You know? We can learn to love kindness. We can be a little bit more generous to one another. We can be a little bit more soft-hearted to one another. And I know what you are hearing. And when I say this, you're thinking about, that guy needs to do this to me and this one. No, no, no. I'm talking about you being that to someone else, okay? So, so stop talking about you, and I'm talking with you to be this to someone else. And then the last one he says, and then to walk humbly with your God. What else is there? To do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly. See, the last one is important. Because when you begin to do things well, and you begin to do things right, and growth takes place, you become very self-aware. What's the word I'm trying to, to look for? You become, you, you begin to build pride in your heart. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? In the sense of, there's nothing wrong about, in Afrikaans, we talk about thoughts. You, you, take, you take pride in the work that you did, you know. Maybe pride is, uh, you understand the context of what I'm trying to explain, right? So, but, but you need to be very careful because maybe God has been good to you and it's gone a little bit to your head. Maybe, may, maybe it's happened to me as well. So the word concludes in this idea and he says, you know, be careful and, and always walk humbly before God. You've been doing fantastic things. You sorted out your spiritual life. You sorted out your family's life. Financially, things are stable in your home. But never forget humility before God. Because humility will keep you generous. Generosity is always the counter for greed. You can never be greedy if you are generous. And that you determine. Okay. Later on in this passage, I'm going to conclude with these two points. God reveals His character in Micah, and God reveals a promise. And I just want to conclude with this, and then we are done for today. Go to the next one for me, please. Micah 7, verse 18. This is the last part of the book of Micah. Remember, Micah is, is talking about judgment the whole time. Because you guys are greedy, because you are stealing, because you're not taking care of people, destruction is on its way. You know, Bad things are going to happen because we are not morally right before God. And then he gives all these judgment elements and this warning of the Syrian invasion and eventually the Babylonian invasion. And now he comes to this conclusion. He says, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgressions. In other words, he was just shouting and screaming and throwing stones, Micah, at the people, and then he concludes after he's calmed down, and he said, you know what, even though we messed up, how many times does God pardon our iniquities and he passes over our transgressions? He carries on, and he, um, you can go to the next one, he puts the focus for the remnant of his inheritance. In other words, he's talking about those, those people that, that were left behind in the process. In other words, the world is moving on 
the world is changing, but there was a remnant that tried to remain faithful to God within their culture. There was a remaining behind that says, we're going to do our best to be committed. And what he's basically saying is that for those who are committed to God, there are these blessings of him passing over the iniquities. You can carry on for the next part. And he says, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. In other words, God takes pride in it that he loves us steadfastly. In other words, he takes pride in it that says, I love you in season and out of season. So the conversation is simple. You know, maybe we weren't even aware of this. Maybe this was just an autopilot thing. But there's growth, there's potential, there's life, there's forgiveness, there's mercy. We just need to decide if we are going to choose to make the changes and there's an abundance of grace the next verse as we're going to conclude says the following and he will again have compassion on us again again you know maybe you've heard this before maybe you messed up a little bit maybe it's time to fix a couple of things but there will again be compassion the next part as i'm going to conclude is god reveals his his promise and now this is a promise for the people he was writing to. But I just want to explain something about, very, about God very quickly. You can go to the last one for me, please. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Long story short, God shows up on the scene. He makes his promises with Israel and they mess things up. But yet again, we have Micah complaining about the character, complaining about the greed, complaining, complaining about the theft. And Micah concludes to say, but God says he will still be faithful to his promise. He will still be loyal. He will still be committed to what he said. All we need to do is just return in the process. And when we return, God doesn't, he's got the right to break the covenant. He doesn't. When we return, he will just take things from there on. We have the opportunity to do that today. I know maybe not, a, not, not as very deep spiritually because you hear money, but I need you to understand that the topic today is extremely spiritually. It's extremely moral because it affects your livelihoods. It affects your ability to be a difference. It affects your, your capabilities of being able to contribute in, compa in comparison to just consuming. So this is a very, very important topic. So I hope that as this message is going out, your, your heart is... Maybe you haven't been prepared for this message this morning, but I hope there's some valuable information and you can do some self-reflection on the inside of your heart. And then you have a conversation with God. And you make a decision. This is between your family. It's between your marriage and God. And then you decide on the inside of your heart. Do I need to make a couple of changes? Can I improve in certain areas? Or are we happy? And are, are we proud of how we are managing what God has blessed us with. Let's pray together. Father, what a powerful message this morning. Father, thank you for the wonderful book of Micah, Father. My prayer is that as we, we draw these valuable life lessons from this book, Father, that we will have the discipline to apply that in our lives, Father. I pray for anyone here, Father, any, anyone that, that feels heavy burdened with guilt, Father, my prayer is that they would understand that this message comes from a heart of love and a heart of compassion, Father, that they will not allow negative emotions, Father, but my prayer is that as a community we will take up our responsibility, Father, that we will hold ourselves accountable to the blessings that we receive, Father, because we want to be a effective church father we want to be effective as the light and the salt in the world father we want to be capable of being a blessing to others father we want to take care of our families well we want to have stability in our lives father so we pray that your grace will be sufficient in our lives so that we can be the best that we can be we pray that in jesus wonderful name and everyone says amen and amen